My name is Alan Tunkel. I'm the Associate Dean for Medical Education here at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University. I'd like to welcome you all to Providence and to the Warren Alpert Medical School. And welcome, too, to our uh, beautiful building here. So this building opened a little more, almost seven years ago. This used to be, you're in a part of Providence that's called the Jewelry District, and this used to be a jewelry manufacturing building. And in talking to some of our staff and our faculty who grew up in, uh, in Rhode Island, they tell me that their parents and relatives used to work in this particular building, so it has a lot of a history. And there certainly um, are a lot of other things that are happening in the jewelry district with expansion of Brown as well as expansion of the University of Rhode Island and Rhode Island College. So you'll see a lot of the construction going on around the building. Uh, I'd also encourage you throughout the day, um, we have a lot of great artwork around the medical school. Not, um, okay. A lot of great artwork around the medical school. On the first floor, we have a new exhibit that just came up a couple of weeks ago. And if you walk around the second and third floor, you'll see a lot of the art from our students. So we have a very active student arts council, so you'll see a lot of their photographs, paintings, and many other things, and sculptures on the second and third floor. When, when I think about sort of uh, my background, I mean, the reason I went to medical school is because I have no talent. But I'm really impressed with a lot of what our students do, and I think probably what all of your students do, and, and a lot of what they bring to the medical school around art, music, humanities, and many other things. So let me just uh, do a few announcements first, and then I'm going to walk you through the agenda. So in your badge, inside the uh, holder, is the breakout session that you've been assigned to, and I'll tell you in a moment how we're going to arrange the breakout se uh, um, sections. In addition, uh, on your agenda, uh, we're going to have dinner tonight at the uh, Rhode Island School of Design. You'll see that the address says Benefit Street. You're actually going to go in the Main Street entrance. So I think that was emailed to everybody. It's actually a lot closer to go in the Main Street entrance. And you don't have to go up the hill that goes at a 45 degree angle to be able to walk there. So it'll be a little easier. Up College Avenue, left on Main, and there's the entrance to the RISD Museum. In addition, uh, at your places, uh, the AMA staff has uh, handed out a, a survey they'd like you to complete entitled AMA Health System Science Exploratory Research. They just ask that you fill it up uh, sometime this morning. Just leave it at your place, and they will uh, pick it up uh, sometime during the day. Uh, other announcements, restrooms are on every floor. Um, there's a, also a gender-neutral restroom on the second floor near the vending machines. So let me, uh, let me take you through the agenda for just a couple of moments. So uh, we're doing the welcome now. I don't think I had to tell you that. And then afterwards, we will have the keynote address by uh, Jim Madera. So after the break, uh, the, the way we have organized this particular meeting is uh, we took three uh, somewhat controversial areas of medical education and we're going to have, uh, we've selected speakers to do pro-con debates. And I'll introduce the speakers when we get to that session. But the, the way things are going to be organized is th they will be in this room. And we're, we're going to set up two podiums in front of the room. And each speaker is going to have about 15 minutes, no more than maybe about five to eight slides, to give their view in each of these controversial areas. After the 15 minutes that they get, there will be allowed about a five-minute rebuttal. There, there's not going to be time for questions, and we've talked to the speakers so they understand the rules and regulations of these debates. So they have to stay at their podium. They are not allowed to walk behind the other person <laughs> while he or she is talking. So they must stay there. And uh, if you don't do it, you know, don't know what's going to happen to you. So we will have those pro-con debates. Uh, then after that, um, we're going to have a lunch breakout session. So all the breakout sessions are on the second floor. So if you take the stairway up to the second floor, uh, you will uh, be there. And we have uh, facilitators for each of these debates. There'll be lunch will be outside the room. So basically, pick up your bag, lunch, go in the room. And the idea is that each of the facilitators will work with you in the group that you've been assigned to to work through each of these controversies in medical education. And the hope is that at the end of that session, uh, you will come up with uh, guidelines, recommendations, or ideas of the way that you think each of these should move forward. 
Uh, after that, we will have our uh, regular medical education day here at the Warren Alpert Medical School. So back in this room, uh, Jeff Borkin is going to lead a session on uh, med ed talks. We had a lot of great submissions. They were really all excellent. It was really hard to narrow it down to four, but Jeff will moderate that and explain that to you at the time of that panel. <clears throat> and then we will have our poster session, uh, session and reception. So there'll be posters on the first two floors of this building, just on the first floor. And we have, I think, close to 90 posters, I believe. So uh, feel free to mingle, walk around, uh, and really have a very nice time interacting with colleagues. And then, as I mentioned, we'll go to the Museum of Art at the Rhode Island School of Design. Again, Main Street entrance for a consortium reception and dinner. And then when we reconvene tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, um, we will, again, be in this room, and we're going to ask each of the facilitators to take about 10 to 12 minutes and present the recommendations from their facilitated workshop around these controversies in medical education. So again, they'll have maybe about 10 to 12 minutes. We're going to do one at a time. And after their presentations, we're going to call on a reactor panel, and I'll introduce them tomorrow, uh, who will comment on these recommendations uh, and uh, make their comments. And the idea really was to bring back or bring in many of the national leaders in medical education, both for their involvement in the LCME, the AAMC, uh, the National Board of Medical Examiners, and the AMA Council on Medical Education, as well as have a student resident and our DIO who will be able to comment on each of these things. And then Susan will wrap it up. The idea in the end is really to come out with a white paper or some type of recommendations in these controversial areas, hopefully from the AMA Consortium on Medical Education. And as I mentioned to the PIs last night, um, I'm really going to hold everybody to coming up with these recommendations, and hopefully we will get some changes. You know, I'm, I'm getting pretty old now. I want there to be some big changes before I die, so I really expect great things to come out of this consortium meeting and being able to move it forward. So uh, again, enjoy your visit here today. I'll also invite you uh, during the break. You certainly can mingle around, look at the artwork. If you want to go up to the fourth floor, we have a terrace that overlooks the city of Providence. It will be a little cool up there, but also will give you a beautiful view. So again, welcome to the meeting, and uh, thanks very much for your attention. I'll introduce Susan Skoshalak, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Susan? Thank you, Alan. I was laughing when he said, you know, there are seats in the front. I'm going to say that again, but I think he must say that to every medical student he meets, don't you think? There are seats in the front. Come on down, guys. So welcome, everyone. This is our 10th meeting of our AMA Accelerating Change in Medical Education Consortium. And I wanted to reflect with you just a little bit of our accomplishments together over this journey. We published a major textbook that within four months of its printing was in a second edition. And this past year, a second faculty handbook on coaching. And we have two more in the works under contract, one on the master adaptive learner and a review textbook on health system science. And in addition, we're contemplating through a vendor request doing a faculty series, a handbook or a field guide series that could highlight all of the major work that our interest groups and our schools and our partners have been doing. We've published over 80 peer review papers, and we've had conservatively at least 300 presentations nationally, internationally, and regionally about the work that you've been doing. In addition, We've supported 10 interest groups that have moved the needle on topics that include leadership, social determinants of health, value-based care, faculty development, et cetera. And many of you, I thank you, got up at 7 to meet together in those work groups today and tomorrow. That's cruel and unusual punishment for all of you from the West Coast, so thank you. I think we better head on out there, and you all have to schedule meetings at 9 o'clock at night just to torture us from the East Coast. 
We've started a series of webinars last year. We've had more than half a dozen, and each time we've offered a webinar on our various topics, we've had close to 500 registrants, and we've established an online community that's been robust and now has 1,200 members. Just to remind you, together we touch 19,000 medical students. And as Dr. Madera reminded those of us at dinner last night, every year those students will take care of 33 million patients. So that's a huge impact on the health of our country. And I thank you for really working inspiringly, diligently, and creatively to change the way that we train our young physicians. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. He's a leader, a colleague, and a friend, Dr. Jim Madera. Dr. Madera serves as the CEO and Executive Vice President of the AMA, a position he's held since 2011. And it was his visionary leadership that helped the governance and the executive groups at the AMA establish a long-term strategic plan with medical education as one of its key components. He's established a pathway of innovation for the AMA that includes the opportunity to establish a design-driven innovation firm, Health 2047, and he serves as the chairman of that organization. His academic credentials are ones that you will recognize and respect. He spent more than two decades at Harvard where he led a NIH-sponsored Harvard Division of Digestive Diseases Center, as well as being a professor of pathology, moved on to work in Emory as chair of pathology before finding his way to Chicago as the dean of the medical school and CEO of the health system at the University of Chicago. He spent some time as a senior partner a senior advisor at Levitt Partners, and he's published more than 200 papers and chapters and served as the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Pathology. He also currently co-chairs the Value, Incentives, and Systems Innovation Collaborative at the National Institute of Health. There's many more things to say about Dr. Madera, but I'd rather let him talk with you about his ideas and vision about innovation in healthcare and medical education. Please warmly welcome Dr. Jim Madera. Well, thanks, Susan. And um, Alan, thank you for inviting us into your home. Uh, you've been a great host. Uh, and I should say I'm completely fine from what I've seen with the consortium with the empty seats down in the front because you know, you go to theater early to get good seats down front, and you go to church early to get good seats in the back. And this seems uh, to be more of a religious uh, kind of experience <laughs> than a theatrical one. <laughs> I mentioned last night at dinner that uh, would speak just very lightly about the consortium. We talked about consortium a bit, and, uh, and Susan has outline uh, some progress, and there will be a full day and a half of that to come. So I thought I would touch on how the AMA is thinking about the future of healthcare. And the best way of doing that is really talking about where we're putting our resources and our effort. So I'm going to talk about the, uh, century, the 21st century needs uh, and the role of physician leadership uh, in healthcare as we see it. Now, Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Now, uh, just a word or two about the uh, AMA. Many people don't recognize of the multiple parts that it consists of. Uh, it has a house of delegates, which are about 180 medical societies. And this house of delegates uh, determines the policy of the AMA. And in that house are all the state societies, uh, the societies from the territories, the four branches of military medicine, uh, and over 120 specialty societies. And that, that includes societies you all know about, you know, American College of Cardiology, uh, American College of Surgery, et cetera. 
and things that you probably haven't heard about, uh, like my favorite is Society of Underwater Medicine, which I just like love thinking about that. Uh, so this now is a representation then of all of these societies, and most physicians belong to two or more of these societies. So from a representational point of view, uh, essentially all American physicians, for the most part, are represented in the House. Then there are direct members, and that's about a quarter of physicians, uh, they're about 235,000, and these are individuals that get uh, resources such as JAMA uh, and the like. We also have practice and business tools, you're probably familiar with the CPT that we steward, uh, the National Physician Master File, etc. cetera. Uh, research and innovation, uh, you, you know, JAMA and the JAMA Network, uh, digital medicine initiatives uh, that we might have time to touch on, and also uh, the Code of Medical Ethics uh, and other aspects uh, that would include this consortium. And advocacy in the states and the courts. Now, the advocacy has a target. We advocate for something very specific. We advocate for our mission, and our mission is to promote the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. And you'll see ways, there are a couple of ways I'll mention where the advocacy unit can memorialize work done by the house and the projects within the clinical domain uh, of the AMA. And under that, as Susan alluded to, has developed an innovation ecosystem. It has many parts in Chicago elsewhere. And I'll touch on some of the West Coast parts of that. So we're in Chicago as a headquarters. Uh, this is our Sand Hill Road, uh, Menlo Park, Silicon Valley, uh, Health 2047 uh, Innovation Studio. You can Google health2047.com. Uh, uh, we just have a spin out that I'll mention that's in Foster City, uh, also in Silicon Valley, and our advocacy unit uh, in DC. So these are the various parts of the AMA. So what about the context uh, that we find ourselves in? Well, the first piece of that is it seems a little uncertain. Uh, it, there seems to be a directionality that is spontaneous and almost surprising uh, coming from the White House uh, now and again, uh, accompanied by uh, some, some really remarkable tweets uh, and uh, other aspects. And then in Congress, uh, we had in 2017, the repeal and replace activity felt like Night of the Living Dead, uh, just kept coming back and back and back. Um, wasn't repealed, but the individual mandate went down with the tax, tax law. So one way of looking at this is saying, look, you know, it's so uncertain, um, what can we accomplish? But it turns out, that there are many actions that can be taken, and there are things that we will need regardless of what health system the country ends up with, and we'll touch on those. So what is then the broader context of we find ourselves in? Just a couple of things that you know to set the context. Uh, first, we know that healthcare is really expensive. Uh, this is just the federal spending, about a trillion. And to give you an idea, uh, let, you'll note two things. So if you look at the, what of these three areas are expanding, it's the health care programs. Uh, and the health care programs threaten to dilute other programs. Uh, to give you an idea of the scale, uh, here in, is included uh, the, the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense budget is greater than the next eight countries combined. Uh, and that includes Russia, it includes China. It's huge. But it's only half of the federal expenditure on healthcare. And so when you think of uh, what's coming down the pike, uh, with the midterms coming up in 2018, uh, the Congress seems to be uh, hunkered down. Um, they're going to have to go through difficult confirmations. Uh, and that's probably most of the activity that you'll see uh, until 2018. But after the midterms and in 2019, 
uh, there's going to be probably a lot of action and turbulence. Remember the tax bill uh, added about $1.4 trillion. Uh, the infrastructure that's being spoken about, the cheapest number I've heard from federal spending is $200 billion. billion. Uh, you've heard what's going on with interest rates, uh, and those interest rates, if there are a couple more this year, would add on about $800 billion uh, that would have to be paid on the tax. That's all going to come out in the wash in 2019. And when you look at this chart, uh, you know, where is the pressure going to be applied? It's also true that in the state budgets, Medicaid tends to be either number one or number two. And so you have the same situation in the states where Medicaid spending, I, I went to a uh, assembly of the leaders in education of the states a few years ago. And the number one threat they saw for education in the state was the expenditure on health care by the states. So another pressure point that we'll see. Now, you all know that the um, United States spends more than other OECD countries. Uh, these are data from about um, uh, 2013, I think. Uh, and what you see in the uh, yellow bars is what is spent as a percentage of GDP uh, directly in healthcare. But then you'll see in the blue bar what's uh, spent as a percent of GDP is social expenditures. And you'll see that if you add both of those together, we're kind of in the middle. Uh, we dominate here and we're last in the social spending. And so you can think of the way we, we're doing this uh, in the U.S. compared with Europe is a sort of a biotechnical complexity of social services, uh, food, other kinds of things that people get uh, that are important to health care. And then at the top, maybe the most complicated type of health care you can imagine in terms of biotechnology, what goes on in surgery, complicated surgery, transplant. And we say that Europe and other OECD countries ration because They'll ration up here, if you're 80 in the UK, uh, you're not going to get a kidney transplant, most likely. Um, but in fact, uh, what we do is ration down here. And so we have to uh, also recognize that we have this dynamic. And I don't think we can expect much more in the way of social spending or public health spending even uh, we have to deal with that in a different way in our country, given our uh, unique view of the world. This is a paper that was published um, just uh, within the last month or two by Anish Ya. And I, you know, I, I would re encourage you to all look at this paper. It's one of the, since I've been at the AMA, I would say this is a, one of the top five publications in JAMA. Um, and uh, the bottom line of this is uh, to talk about pricing of health care, but there are a couple of other things that can be pointed out. Well, he took, uh, Anish took the U.S., shown in yellow, so all the yellow squares are the U.S., uh, and then 10 other OECD countries that are the wealthiest of the OECD countries, and he stacked those up against each other. And a couple of things I'll point out. He shows that Social spending per capita is kind of average in the U.S. among this group. But the reason it falls out low in the previous analysis is because we have a lot higher poverty rate. Uh, so the per capita doesn't cover that. The other interesting thing is if you look at how we can stack up with inpatient care and outpatient care, inpatient care, uh, we're almost next to last uh, in terms of expenditure and outpatient care uh, were first. So this points out this dramatic shift that has occurred in the disease burden in the United States from acute episodic uh, inpatient needs to these outpatient needs. Uh, points it out in a really dramatic way. We also know that if we concentrate on certain populations, uh, we can isolate a lot of the expense. We know that 5% of the spenders, the, the most expensive patients, account for half of our spending. And if we look at the Medicare 
data, 25% uh, of the Medicare beneficiaries with the highest cost, 75% have more than one chron chronic disease. So see the last slide, you see this slide, you see how important chronic disease is, and I know there was a session on, on chronic disease uh, this morning. And then lastly, um, so, social determinants. Here's just a, a reminder of that from the data I take from Chicago. If you come to our building downtown and look at the condos around it, uh, the life expectancy is about 85 years. You know, Lincoln Park, Gold Coast, uh, uh, River North. If you jump in your car and you go 20 minutes south uh, to Garfield Park, uh, the expected life expectancy is 69 years. So this is a 16 year difference in a 20 mile drive. When did the United States overall have a 16 year difference? Uh, if you start in 2011, you have to go back to the mid 1930s, the time of the Dust Bowl, to get that 16 year difference. So that 20 minute drive takes you back to Dust Bowl era in terms of longevity. Uh, so this is, these are the contexts we find ourselves in. So given these, you know, what, what are the efforts uh, that the AMA is taking? And there are three strategic arcs that we're following, and the initiating projects in these arcs are shown on the left. Uh, professional satisfaction, practice sustainability, the ACE consortium, which I'll just briefly mention, and improving health outcomes uh, dealing with chronic disease. Uh, and I should say an important player in all of this uh, is Ken Sherrigan, who I think is here in the back of the room, um, uh, very religious, uh, <laughs> uh, who uh, heads up the strategy uh, elements uh, of the AMA. So let me just touch on these three strategic arcs, starting with solving the chronic disease dilemma. I'll just say a word about ACE, uh, which was the effort that kicked off guiding professional development. And I'll say then some things about uh, professional satisfaction, developing critical tools and policies for the field, and talk about some elements of data, thinking about data uh, that we're uh, actively engaged in. So first, let's start with IHO and work backwards. So we took as a model for thinking about chronic disease uh, two players, hypertension and prediabetes. And the reason we did this is if you look at years of lost life between 1990 and 2010, ischemic heart disease and stroke combined are very high and dominant, the greatest burden. And of course, high blood pressure is a major risk factor here. Uh, so that was a huge disease burden. And we took prediabetes and diabetes because it was the greatest change over this period. Uh, and in fact, uh, in countries that are um, developing, uh, but now where they're developing a middle class like China, uh, you'll see that up to a third, between a third and a half of the population are probably prediabetics. Uh, in this country, about 86 million. Uh, are prediabetics. So I'm not going to say a lot about our work in prediabetes. I'll allude to that. Um, I will say something now about the work in hypertension. Uh, 75 million Americans have hypertension, but curiously, 35 million of those know they have hypertension, they're seeing a provider, and yet it's not controlled. So that's a population uh, that we're focused on. Uh, we've produced tools. Uh, and piloted those in the Carolinas and shown that applying these tools and practices, we could move uh, control of hypertension from about a 65% rate to an 85% rate with a uh, 16 millimeter mercury uh, uh, systolic blood pressure drop. And if you look at the literature, um, if you get blood pressure drops 12 to 13, this is 16 in populations, uh, you prevent about half, about uh, a third of the strokes, uh, and a quarter of the cardiovascular events. So in a large population, this could be incredibly important in thinking about chronic disease. So we've gone on now uh, to establish a formalized 
relationship with the American Heart Association. And we have an interface charter which allows um, the chimeric team to be nimble, not be under two bureaucracies, so to speak, uh, in contracting and whatnot. And we began uh, in 2017 uh, to recruit to this program. And the five-year goals are to have 80% control rates in our, all participating systems, no gap in race or ethnic control rates. And so this will be a way of approaching uh, social determinants uh, issue. Uh, we want 100 million lives covered uh, by 2020. And as of the last quarter of 2017, uh, we had enough data and sites submitting data that we are already in, in a, about 3.4 million uh, hypertensives. So we're trying to uh, scale this. And again, these things, the work here and the work in prediabetes that I'm not talking about, it's about hypertension and it's about prediabetes. It's more just work on chronic disease to see if we can start picking the lock on chronic disease. Because as you know, the evidence from the field of cancer, for example, is that we're going to have many less cures than we are going to have conversions to a, a clinically manageable chronic disease. So the chronic disease burden in this country will just keep on increasing, most likely. I'm not going to mention much about the accelerating change in med ed. Um, I will say that uh, you sometimes wonder if you interact with people in politics or in business, uh, they will ask questions like, how do you know these people are competent? Uh, uh, by the way, when um, President Obama uh, did this, he, you can see he has no hat. And the story uh, was, I said, why, why, don't you, why don't you wear a cap? He said, after the Dukakis debacle in that tank with that little hat on, <laughs> when he was attacked as looking like Snoopy, uh, he said he would never wear a hat. And Susan has gone over some of the um, uh, really dramatic contributions of the consortium. Uh, she mentioned health system science and uh, many of the things, including Brown's uh, work in, in population health, primary care population health, you know, sort of fall into this category. And uh, I have to say, I go around and in the Institute of the National Academy, um, NIH, uh, you know, AHIP meeting, the strategic AHIP meetings of the summer, everyone's saying, how are we going to produce physician leaders? Why don't physicians know about population health? How do we get physicians to think about uh, electronic clinical data in a more organized way? So all the things that this textbook touches on. So if this is what we think of the consortium. <laughs> You're great. Uh, Keep going and push yourself, as I said last night. And so now on to the third strategic arc of professional satisfaction. So let me first summarize some of the work we've done in collaboration with Rand on one hand, Dartmouth on another, and Mayo on a third. Uh, we did a multi-market national study in collaboration with Rand and followed that up. And we find that the primary driver of physician satisfaction you won't be surprised, uh, others were surprised by this, is time with patients and feeling that they had enough time to do a good job with their patients. And that was number one, number two, number three. That was way above everything else. And the dissatisfiers uh, were things that interfered with the above. Now, there, some of those were internal to practices, and we've developed steps forward modules uh, that can allow individuals to improve their practice through this means. In fact, they're recognized by CMS now as practice improvement tools. But some of those were external, too. The largest one external was the state of the electronic medical record, not surprising to this group. And I'll say a word or two about that. And then we did a multi-market uh, time motion study with Dartmouth that many of you are familiar with, where we find less than a third of the physician workforce time is directly interfacing with patients. And the predominant activity is data entry and administrative, and that goes to evenings as well. Now, this was all time motion. Uh, the evening was self-reported. 
uh, but I talked with Jonathan Bush, uh, who's now recorded from the cloud the clicks that happen at night, and verifying that there's a couple hours at night on average that physicians spend. It's really interesting because there are peak times uh, where everyone is on the electronic medical record, yet the clicks slow down, and there are all the physician shows. So house is a big hit, for example. <laughs> Uh, and then lastly, work with uh, Mayo. We, we've done burnout measurements in 2014, 2014, uh, multiple sites. The 2017 data analysis is in process. And we show the burnout went from the low 40s to about 50% in that three year period. We'll find out what happened in 2017. So we have these people that are highly motivated, highly skilled, highly trained. They went in the field to spend time with patients. They become data entry clerks, and it's dissatisfying. So the response is, um, first of all, to make this recognizable to uh, those that lead uh, academic medical centers and large clinical enterprises, whether it be Mayo, Cleveland, uh, partners. Uh, and we've created a, a group of CEOs uh, to help think through this. Um, to evolve the medical profession, uh, you know, the CEO consortium, but also leading a revolution in medical education. So as we shift from inpatient to outpatient, from acute to chronic, uh, to things that need to have a population health point of view, that we train people for that future. Uh, we develop critical products in healthcare. Um, I've mentioned the steps forward modules. Uh, that one can assess at the AMA site. Uh, also advancing digital health, data standards, value-based care. I will talk about these two elements uh, in a second. I will mention Exertia, which is a, uh, founded by AMA, American Heart, and HIMSS, uh, now many others, developing digital guidelines. You know, mobile health applications, uh, guess how many mobile health applications there are? 360,000, about 400 a day are produced. And it's a, it's a, it's a zoo, uh, it's a wild west out there. Uh, there are a few that have evidence-based validation, they're actionable, almost none are connected, even those that hit those three criteria. Uh, so something that um, I referred to a couple of years ago is the digital snake oil of the 21st century, which people didn't like. Uh, but it's true, it was a warning sign. We, this is gonna be important, we have to get this sorted out so it's trustworthy and connected. Um, uh, health reform, leadership, and then revolutionizing approaches to chronic disease, paying for preventative care. In our diabetes prevention programs, uh, the work we did with prediabetes in association with the CDC and uh, non-classical players like the YMCAs, uh, we took uh, that work to Avalier that does a CBO-like score. It scored positively. Uh, our advocacy team then worked with the regulators at CMS uh, to encourage those regulators to take a look at this. They did. They got a CBO score that was also positive and mirrored the Avalier score. And as of this month, diabetes prevention programs are reimbursed by Medicare. Uh, and I think outside of things like vaccination and screening, it's sort of the first preventative uh, type of uh, reimbursement uh, that we're seeing. And we hope there's much more of it. Federal government is now reimbursing this for federal employees as well. So that's spreading. And lastly, um, maybe I'll touch on Q&A if we have time, deploying community assets while avoiding medicalization. Uh, there is a, an experiment uh, going on from uh, uh, the innovation studio on the West Coast uh, that thinks about prevention in a dramatically different way. Because the question here is, if you think about prevention and you medicalize prevention, what do you think will happen with cost? You know, are there other ways of doing this? And the trick there is to think about it rather than as a medical intervention that's preventative, to think about it through the lens of personal care. And the person leading this project was the head of product development at Procter & Gamble for 20 years. 
Uh, so think about it as, as, as the, way, the way you think about toothpaste and hair gel um, and get the short-term incentives right. You know, the toothpaste story is that the initial jingle for toothpaste was use this twice a day to brush and you'll have less caries. Well, the caries are a few years out. Uh, you needed something more immediate. And that ended up having folks adding mint. And then the story became, use this twice a day and you're kissable. And everyone wants to be kissable. Uh, so we maybe have to think of uh, the way we've approached societies in personal care uh, as another model of this. Now, certain problems faced by physicians really require larger transformative solutions. Um, and I'm just going to take the example of clinical data uh, and give you two examples of work we've done in the clinical data realm. So as Jane said, you know, it's not about the data, it's about what you do with the data in terms of making sense of it. Abernathy, big data in context is going to be the most important data set in our future. So we all know that big data is going to be incredibly important. Uh, we know that AI is going to be incredibly important. But AI is good at some things and not at others. Uh, it's not good at extrapolation, for example. Um, and it can only analyze what you put into it. You know, there was a, a well-known study now done within the last year at Pittsburgh where they used AI to determine if there was a population of pneumonia, people with pneumonia, that could be sent safely home as opposed to aggressively treated. And the AI was done, the population that could be sent safely home was identified, and people were astounded because the population were asthmatics. And the underlying reason that that came out as the answer is the institution had established programs whereby asthmatics were trained to know uh, early onset to present, and they were aggressively treated. Uh, but that context wasn't fed in to the neural network. And so we have to really uh, think about these things in great, great detail. Now, our innovation ecosystem, which I'll talk about mostly uh, in, in the building in Chicago and on the West Coast, but there's other sites as well, uh, one uniform thing about it is we flip the model. We think about flipping the model to define the problems in healthcare. So should we define the problems in healthcare at this administrative level or around to the patient and the physician? And right now, we largely do it here. And it, in theory, is a good idea. I like to recite the fact that University of Chicago bookstore you know, had this t-shirt that would say in the front of it, uh, that's all well and good in practice and on the back, but how's it look in theory? And uh, we've had a little bit of this mind think uh, in producing tools and resources uh, in healthcare. And so physicians often get thrown over the transom, these things that um, theoretically were sound, but they actually just don't work uh, that well in practice. And you know what do others do? Do GM, Ford, Honda, who do they view as customer? Do they think it's the dealership or do they think it's the driver and the mechanic? So we need to flip our definitions of where the problem base is. You know, the, the C-suite to the patient, all levels are important, but the phys patient-physician interface is, in our view, the source of truth in defining the problem of interest. So we need to define problems at the patient level, then work up through the system. Don't start at the administrative level. And for those of you that do science, you, you know, the important thing is to state the right question, and you can only do it around the patient uh, and the physician. So we take this flip model, and we think of it as a system that then works out to administrative levels, rather than these tiny little problems that you see administratively uh, that create individual one-off solutions that are all thrown over the transom into the physician-patient space. 
And you know, I liken it to, um, you know, the, you saw the, the tower in Chicago, or the building that we're in is 47 stories. You can't build a big tower like that by nailing together 10,000 dog houses. And that's kind of the approach now in medicine. So a couple of things that we're doing. One is a collaborative health data initiative uh, for better patient care. That when we talk about interoperability, there's a disconnect. If you go to the CEOs of health systems and you say, do you have interoperability? They'll say, you know, it's coming. Yeah, we, uh, pretty, it's pretty good. And the same institution, you go down and you talk with the physicians and say, what are you talking about? There's no interoperability. And the reason for that, um, you know, Eric Schmidt, who was chair at Google, uh, past CEO at Google, at HIMSS, made this point very nicely uh, a couple months ago, that there are different tiers of interoperability that we need. One tier uh, is administrative to get administrative workflow right. And that has actually developed and is developing. Another tier is that second tier to get clinical data organized so that it has meaning at the point of care. And there, we're not in such good shape right now. So this uh, uh, integrated health model initiative is toward the organization of clinical data. You know, data should be the solution. But you know, right now, if you look at our coding sets, that don't include state, you, our coding sets cannot differentiate this state from that state. It's remarkable. And healthcare data are fragmented. They're incomplete, incompatible, variable by system, not always machine readable. You know, when we, uh, three years ago, when we first went to the Office of the National Coordinator to talk about these things, uh, What's defined by interoperability is the ability to exchange about 24 elements, and most of those are administrative. Uh, at that time, there wasn't a single criteria for usability uh, in defining interoperability. So, you know, we lack information on patient function state, patient goals, as well as patient and device generated data. You know, physicians aren't wild about. Um, a bunch of numbers written down on a piece of paper uh, taken at home sometime in the past and you know can't remember if the diastolic or the systolic is on top or the bottom and uh, you know bring those into the office it's it's disjointed um, our current technical standards specify how we to exchange data but don't specify what's the most important data to exchange and in what format and this reality produces friction, and that friction falls on physicians, uh, giving the data I showed in our national studies. So the integrated health model initiative is to take inputs and outputs, uh, to take all of the code sets that are organized, uh, make sure they're machine re readable, fill gaps and delete redundancies, and then create an ontology of function. Uh, only things that are truly accepted by, say, the subspecialty societies, like blood pressure. But add things that we think of as subjective, like the patient goals, patient reported outcomes, that are frankly no more subjective than a lot of the things we currently use. Uh, and we think that they, they, think that they are. So, so what, what we're doing here is essentially this. You know, the current state is the elements are one by one, incomplete and fragmented. But we want to integrate the elements into objects, concepts, and images. So here's an example. We're interested, as I mentioned, in, in hypertension. We're doing hypertension work using this model. It's a market-driven model. It's open to everyone. Um, our hypertension group show that there are 74 data elements that are needed to completely understand hypertension. 10% of those are not represented by any current code set. So there are gaps that need to be filled. So the process is to take an expert opinion, in this case, 74 data elements representing hypertension. It goes to a clinical validation group. And the clinical validation group weighs in on whether there's a evidence base that supports 
uh, the proposal that this state of disorder is characterized by 74 data elements. And if that's the case, then it goes to the informaticists that take these data elements to produce a data object. Uh, so one at the point of care can have an organized conceptual uh, uh, framework so that the data can be moved from knowledge and from knowledge into meaning uh, at the point of care. Um, let me give you an example of a potential extension of this. You know, could you imagine, you, many of you probably saw Michael Porter's uh, uh, article in a Harvard Business Review uh, around the end of um, 2017, where he talks about combining physical and digital uh, interfaces. So you can have you know, a car uh, going down a street, and you can have the digital interface here. But when you do the AR and overlap them, you just incredibly increase the richness and the transference of meaning. Could you imagine then, like an EHR, where you're you know, patient with hypertension, you want to look at that, and the 75 data elements are organized into one object, and then the important elements are overlaid uh, on an avatar that may be color-coded. Uh, and so you see the entire image, and that image is known to convey information probably at a rate of 10 to 100 times more efficiently than looking through a chart for numbers and trying to put it together on your own. So organizing clinical data uh, so that it's useful for physicians is really important. This model is open. Um, we have other groups that uh, are interested in submitting data elements describing diseases they're interested in. Uh, we launched this the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, th these were some of our launch partners uh, that you know, I think this had wide uptake in the market and market testing. Uh, it made a lot of sense to people. You don't have to explain it to physicians. They immediately get it. Uh, but corporate types now get it as well. But if we get there, we need something else that we're lacking. We need a system that provides secure, permissions-based transport of more meaningfully organized clinical data. Now, medicine is a multi-sided market. And most multi-sided markets have low-cost utilities that take whatever the value is in the system and spread it at low cost, but securely. Um, we don't have such a thing in medicine. So what am I talking about? We have a power utility uh, that spreads electrons. We have the currency utility due to the SWIFT system that allows secure international currency exchange and banking. This is Chicago's water utility uh, for secure um, spread and uh, the utility that transports efficiently uh, water. Uh, we need a clinical data utility. And this was the kind of scale of project that made us uh, create something like our innovation studio, Health 2047. Um, it had to be at a major tech center. Uh, there had to be governance separation so that there could be, excuse me, there could be the recruitment of people under the same sort of conditions that they're used to working in Silicon Valley. Uh, and it had to be located at a site like Silicon Valley. And, you know, the interface is between the AMA and Health 2047 that ta has taken a lot of time and effort to get that bi-directional transfer correct. Um, we modeled this in part after InQtel, which is the innovation studio developed by uh, the CIA uh, in the late 90s. And it's been very effective. Uh, so effective we no longer have privacy. Uh, <laughs> the person who did the operating plan, a fellow named Tom Frederick, uh, for InQtel was uh, also the uh, global technology head at Arthur Anderson, uh, was now out on his own as an investor, and Tom is now full-time in Health 2047, as are uh, some other incredible people. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the fellow that um, uh, co-developed Siri, uh, and some really remarkable people are involved in Health 2047. 
And it turns out that we have been able to um, develop a prototype of a data liquidity utility for clinical data, uh, and that is recently spun out into a company called Akiri uh, that's also uh, in the Valley area. Um, and the first customer uh, has already been identified as Celgene. And the reason a pharmaceutical would be interested in this is that it, you know, there's something called the REMS program that any of you that worked with these REMS drugs probably hate. It takes you, you know, 20 minutes to fill out all the forms uh, for you know, sort of post-market surveillance where you have, say, a, a drug that has mutagenic potential. You need to make sure that a pregnant woman never gets such a drug. Uh, and yet the data are kind of bad because since they're manually entered, there are errors, uh, it's not timely. Uh, and so this kind of thing, uh, these kinds of things would <coughs> underpin the business plan that would make the utility cheap uh, for those that use it as providers. So we have uh, the AMA, gets environmental intelligence. We can identify the pain points around the physician on the patient, get that definition accurate. Uh, we then go, Health 2047 does market soundings, uh, solutions. Uh, we're developing an investor ecosystem, one of the best of asset class of all these stakeholders. Uh, those uh, assets then uh, help provide the work in Health 2047 as well as uh, invest in the spin-out companies. Uh, this was our first spin-out company we expect to have probably a minimum of two uh, in 2018 uh, in different areas as well. Now the other alignment, as you saw the strategic arcs of the AMA, professional development, um, dealing with chronic disease, uh, professional satisfaction, and practice sustainability is the three strategic arcs. Well, there are strategic pillars in Health 2047, and these are the commercial translation of the AMA's strategic arcs. And then the guide rails for the investors are the pillars of Health 2047 that are the translation commercially of the strategic arcs of the AMA. Uh, and this is something where I think you know, it requires physician leading uh, these efforts uh, because who best understands problem definitions at the truth of the system around the patient? It's not C-suite administrators. Uh, it's physicians. So a carry switch is a utility for secure clinical data liquidity. Uh, blockchain network as a service platform. Um, and uh, we're working with uh, three or four uh, large companies we expect to be able to uh, close this with. Uh, and you know the thing that we have to recognize is the AMA has always been terrific at advocacy in DC. But what happens in DC and CMS does not always align with what we want. You know, we try to shape that as much as we can. But, you know, if we get an 80-20 win in legislation, uh, you tend to take that. It's the way life works. Well, the driver of innovation now, you step back and look at Washington, you say, okay, where, where's innovation going to come from in healthcare? Is it going to come from <coughs> DC? Or is it going to come from the private sector? And you've seen all the activity in the private sector. Uh, and physicians have to be in there leading that. Uh, and I think it's really important for the field and for the future of medicine. So there are many uncertainties in healthcare reform. But regardless of how things move, legislatively, there are things that we know. We know we have to better manage chronic disease and it'll be more and more chronic disease. We know we have to restructure physician training to match the future need, which you guys are doing. We have to move from 10,000 dog houses nailed together to a beautiful tower, a real system. And we have to radically enhance the environment of the patient-physician interface. I mean. Two hours of administrative work and data entry for one hour uh, interfacing with patients. You know, any business person that you reveal this to uh, are just, they're completely shocked. They're completely shocked. 
uh, we have to produce data that optimize clinical meaning. And we have to produce systemic liquidity to meaningful clinical data. So as Churchill may have said, because he's quoted to, as saying a lot of things that he didn't say, um, you know, you've got to succeed in doing what is necessary. And that's, in our view, flipping the model, defining problems at the right place, and with physicians in the lead. And I want to thank you as a consortium uh, for doing this in your space uh, so well. And you know, do well. And by that, I mean create the medical school in the future. So thank you. Susan says I should take questions. I always do what Susan says. Um, just wondering about where the use of interprofessional teams and interprofessional education plays into the innovation and innovation in care models and what the AMA is doing maybe in uh, concert with other professional organizations. Yeah. So a lot of that is being done in this consortium. But I have to say, in addition, there are tools that will be needed. So um, let me give you an example. If you, if you look at the Aetna-CVS proposed merger, say, well, what, what does that mean? Um, what uh, they will say is that the clinics uh, where they'll have extenders they want to use for low-hanging fruit, um, people that need wellness counseling, uh, individuals that uh, have other kinds of things that aren't so well done in physicians' offices. Um, but they need to connect that, since we have chronic disease, to the primary care physician. And then they also, um, of course, sell devices and things that measure, including cuffs. Uh, and they want to get patients with blood pressures and other measurements at home uh, and have that transferred to the medical record. So you look at them and say, well, yeah, you know, everyone would agree with that. How are you going to do it? What's the system? And they don't have the system. And that's why they need like an IHMI and an Akiri switch. Um, you know, one of the data elements that is missing in, for hypertension is a Bluetooth-mediated transfer of a me measurement at home. But even if that's transferred into the, into the record, it still has to be organized as an object with all that other data. Uh, physicians shouldn't have to go sorting that out themselves. So uh, those are the things that touch on interprofessional, I think, interactions from this technical point of view. Because you know, chronic disease uh, continuity is so important. Um, one of the most interesting papers I read in a while, just recently published in the New England Journal, was the Black Barbershop uh, Hypertension Study, the role of decentralization of managing chronic illness in the United States. Is the AMA and part of all of this kind of thinking about how physicians and our uh, profession still plays a role as we are starting to see that decentralization may be more impactful in managing these illnesses than just office visits alone? So uh, decentralization will be very important but it has to be connected. Otherwise, I mean, one of the lesions that is so devastating in healthcare now is its fragmentation. So producing yet another fragment doesn't help if it's not connected. Um, you know, the black barbershop movement was actually started uh, 15, 20 years ago uh, on the south side by Eric Whitaker, south side of Chicago. Um, and Eric, we were able to, when I was at Chicago, uh, uh, recruit him as our Vice President for Community Affairs, but it's the connection uh, that's so important, and it's the same with all these digital devices. Uh, it has to be connected. Has, it has, you know, things that are come from other sites that physicians are going to see in terms of the care, you know, it has to come from something that's evidence-based, validated, actionable, and connected. 
Uh, thank you for your comments and uh, congratulations on really transforming the AMA under your leadership. Uh, I'd like to speak a little bit more about payment reform. It strikes me that much of what we're trying to do is to um, make the digital lives of physicians easier through workarounds. But fundamentally, the EHR is driven um, to operationalize what I think is a really dysfunctional payment reform that that, um, that pays for widgets, right? That pays for how many review systems questions you asked and how many physical exam maneuvers you did rather than um, whether or not the patient got the counseling they needed to, to change the behaviors that were are essential for them. And so I'm wondering what the AMA is thinking about um, in terms of um, sort of recalibrating uh, payment strategies that uh, for things that are actually more outcome rather than possibly. Yeah, so we have a um, national consortium that's working on value-based uh, payment um, that's heavily driven by our advocacy group. Um, you know, value is also embedded in as one of the pillars of Health 2047 uh, uh, as well. I have to say there are some surprising things that, um, if correct, uh, could change our thinking around this uh, a bit. And I'll mention two of them. The first is a paper by Anish Ya. And Anish's um, data would suggest that our current reimbursement techniques do not drive volume any more than, uh, you know, they're driven by non, uh, uh, you know, piecemeal reimbursement by other OECD countries. So that's the first thing. Are we actually sure about that? Uh, the second thing comes from the, uh, the, some work that we're doing at the AMA and the social science literature. Um, and it's based on, based on uh, observations from uh, uh, social economics and behavioral economics. And you can find that embedded kind of in the work in, of Kahneman uh, um, and, uh, you know, the work that's uh, gone on through the Nobel last year. What behavioral economics uh, would tell you is that if you are dealing with a group of professionals that have cognitively complex tasks, physicians, um, the way you motivate is to determine what their intrinsic incentives are not their extrinsic incentives. We know what intrinsics are from the RAND studies. It's time with patients, and we know what's getting in the way of that. It's also known in that literature that if you start throwing in extrinsic incentives, you can screw up the intrinsic. That's much more powerful. And the degree that you screw that up depends on a couple of things. For example, if you use money, small amounts of money and multiple such incentives, it totally screws everything up. So we built our incentive system uh, during the time where sort of a Milton Friedman view of economics uh, was the only game in town. You know, when Kahneman started his work, uh, he was thought to be a crank and, you know, uh, 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 and so that got embedded in our current system, but yet we know from behavioral economics that we're using the wrong incentive systems. And there are even uh, papers that demonstrate this. Uh, there it was a paper, the name will come to me, um, a fellow from Wharton uh, published uh, two years ago in the, in the uh, American uh, Economic Reviews. And he took two groups of cardiovascular surgeons, and in one group said, I will incentivize you with money if you, you know, change this reimburse, uh, re, um, readmission rate. Uh, with the other group, he said, what do you want? What do you think you need to practice better? And they said, well, how about uh, real-time comparative data feedback? That's what we want. And didn't even mention quality measures to the second group. Both groups increased quality at the end of the day. The group that got what it wanted by its intrinsic driver was 400 uh, percent above the increase in quality of the other. So uh, I would say that one thing when we start thinking about 
value and cost, uh, we probably have to start rethinking incentives. Now, economic incentives are powerful at the administrative institutional level, but once you go down to physicians and patients uh, where the action is, you have to think about it in an entirely different way. And these, you know, these um, uh, places where physicians like to work, uh, that tend to have physician leaders, uh, often pay attention to these sorts of things, to those primary motivators. First of all, thank you for your talk and for your important work at the AMA. When, you, when this consortium came together, you spoke to us about the medical school of the future, a school without walls, not being time-based. At this point, uh, four years later, what do you think we need to do if we have to do three to five things to create the medical school of the future and medical training in the future? So um, I'll start with a, a um, where, where, you, where a, a foot can be placed on that mountain uh, almost immediately. Uh, we've done work and are now making uh, a investment in an education center. Um, and that, the first steps were to get, you know, JAMA, JAMA network, AMA things on the same platforms uh, to make them more digitally interesting, uh, to create something that then physicians can use uh, as an active interactive uh, center. And one of the projects that is online for the education center is health system science. To get health system science as a course that can be digitally obtained through the education center. Uh, and I think that's a first step in a movement towards sort of this virtual, uh, you know, a virtual environment uh, that I think will be important at least as a trial uh, to see how, how that works. Uh, so I, I think those things are already been developed as offshoots of things that the consortium has done. So as a practicing physician, I'm very enticed by the idea of the clinical data utility and liquidity of data between various systems. The truth is many of us practice at the intersection of a lot of uh, 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 disparate um, healthcare systems that are often competing. And the patients, particularly the underserved patient population, is uh, that patient population is often very mobile and cared for in, in often competing healthcare systems. So how do you get those healthcare systems to pull together and to actually formulate uh, a, uh, a data utility system? Like that? Yeah, so what, what to do about data blocking in institutions uh, that try to use that as uh, stickiness for patients? And part of the solution there, I think, is defining whose data it is. Um, you define it as the patient's data. Uh, that issue goes away. And also, if the patients can determine who has access to their data uh, in a secure way uh, through something like a curie, and a curie doesn't, uh, neither a curie or IHMI holds the data. Uh, so it's more like you know, you go to Paris and you put your ATM card in you get your cash, it's not like that stays in that particular ATM. Uh, it disappears then. Uh, so the same kind of system that is used in the financial marketplace for data transfer, but under, under the patient's control. Uh, you commented briefly about CVS and Aetna and Optum and others. Uh, can I ask you, Talk just a bit more about that because these very large uh, corporate entities, I think, have a very administrative view of the future of healthcare, which might not include those most complex patients that you talked about. And is the AMA and these groups are working proactively to be sure that the physicians are an integral part of the future discussions and model, rather than in essence being removed from first contact? Yeah, the the answer is yes. Um, conversations CVS. Aetna, as an example, is to point out that, yeah, you're right, you do have to have all this data organized under the primary care physician, and you know there's no way of doing that now. Um, and so we're talking to them about, you know, uh, that. Uh, the J.P. Morgan, uh, Amazon, uh, Berkshire, um, 
uh, announcement was kind of interesting in that, um, to me, it showed the power of brand because it changed the market. It was on front pages of all the papers. But if you look at the announcement, it didn't say anything. You know, it was like, we have this idea. And it was just the power of the brands that were capturing people. Uh, I heard Jamie Dimon talk about this uh, more recently. And it starts sounding a little more real. And we have a, a line into that group. Uh, when they announced it, they thought of it as a as something that would report to HR, which I thought was sort of the kiss of death, because companies always talk about the expense of health care, but the way they handle it is they let HR deal with it. Um, HR interacts with the CFO just to check to make sure there's not something incredibly violent being done economically. Uh, it doesn't, it hardly makes it up to the C-suite. Uh, so this looked bad from the beginning, but the way um, the new iteration is, as you know, they're searching for a CEO. Uh, they want to get a medical scientist, a population scientist, so a real team, so to speak, doing it as a non-for-profit, and then looking at points um, where value might be uh, better obtained. And, and those points include overutilization, underutilization, chronic disease. Uh, how you deal with those things. Um, and to do small projects and try to distribute learnings uh, if successful. So again, I think these are areas where physicians just have to insert themselves and you know, our market soundings, uh, I think it's a whole new day now where these people see what happens with um, a 23andMe that gets into an area where it shouldn't have about six years ago, or um, you know, a Theranos that's just going to blow smoke at everyone else. Uh, uh, they realize the risks are somewhat different uh, when it comes to healthcare. It's a very complicated system, uh, a lot of opportunities, and the people that know about that are, are physicians. And in fact, this is so widely thought of now in some some corporate areas. That you, it was said to me uh, five or six years ago in a way that was ridiculous, but made the point. And I was at an economic meeting for a couple of days at Stanford with about 16 people, mostly economists. And someone asked the question about, what's this thing with GME? And so I was explaining how you know, medical schools are expanding, GME slots are not, you know, there's a barrier there. Uh, we could end up with medical school graduates uh, with no placement for uh, residency, uh, uh, and the guy sitting beside me was an economist from Berkeley. He said, that sounds great. <laughs> and I said, well, explain that to me. He said, well, if you look at all the other professional schools, uh, their product, JDs, MBAs, et cetera, are unif uniform, uni uh, uniformly equilibrated throughout all industry. But physicians stick to their knitting. And yet, this is a big cost for everyone. It's almost 20% of our GDP. And the people, we all know, you know CEOs that are MDs, but that's not equilibrated to the same. Uh, and he said, the, nothing would be more motivating than having these smart people having to go into other, other fields other than taking care of patients. So it, it was a ridiculous argument that made this point. And you know, I've had the same thing mentioned to me by a CEO of a, um, large venture and private equity concern, AEA in New York, and at a luncheon he said, you know, Jim, what, I need MDs that can be CEOs of my health-related firms, uh, so I have someone who knows what they're talking about, and I can't find any. What's up with that? In the same um, trip, or maybe a subsequent trip, I was out to uh, lunch with some people, and we did a, I asked how many MDs were in the capital markets for healthcare as um, analysts. And the answer was probably between uh, five and 600 analysts in the capital markets for healthcare, two thirds of them are MDs. When you look at who those MDs are, they're largely uh, one of two categories. Uh, the largest category is people fresh out of school, many of which did not do residency. Some of them did partial residencies. And the others of which 
are specialty people that um, practiced in highly academic settings for a few years. So they're the analysts in the capital markets, and our problem is chronic disease in the community. I mean, even the analysts in the capital mark markets may not make that much sense. Uh, Thank you for your talk and the innovation and the inspiration and support of the work that it does. Um, what comment might you further have to add to address the kind of external drivers of these physician extenders that are being trained that may not have um, as much experience or that knowledge that you're talking about who um, are to some extent taking training sites and being promoted by external systems is a cheaper way of getting that chronic disease management done, but are, are actually driving that fee-for-service specialist mentality of health systems. Yeah, I mean, I, we, you know, the AMA has a policy around these areas, and in a nutshell, it's we don't want to create more fragments, we want less fragments. So things have to be connected, and they should be connected uh, and overseen uh, by the individual who knows and is highly trained uh, in that area, that's largely a physician. And as you know, physicians have a long and distinguished record of interacting with all other kinds of uh, professions uh, in healthcare uh, in their offices and coordination with others. Um, it's also why, if you look at even the minute clinics, things like this, there are uh, the there may be not a physician on site, but there's a physician oversight uh, at those areas. It's probably not as tight uh, as it needs to be. Um, so I, I think the principle here is it's not that we don't get along with everyone else. We love everyone else. It's just that we know that fragmentation is a problem uh, in the system, and we don't want to create more fragments. So, let's call it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.